Hey, Andy, how's it going today? Hey, I'm doing awesome. How are you doing, Mitch? I'm doing really well. My first question for you is, who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Andy Moreno, and I'm a DIY promoter and a booking agent for numerous spots here in the Pacific Northwest. Great. And uh, you're a founder of Cap City Presents, and that's the co company you kind of oversee doing all that work. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. We're a, a DIY booking service that assists bands with, uh, you know, tour dates and, you know, finding new places to perform and such. Cool. Well, I have a few questions about that. I've booked tons of shows as a person who plays in bands myself, and I've never really gone to a booking person like yourself, whether we're playing local or, or touring around. Um, I'm kind of curious, like, what do you offer bands that bands can't do themselves? Uh, so I guess what's what's special about being, I guess, in particular, a DIY promoter is, um, you know, if you contact me, I can say, hey, I can contact O'Malley's, I can contact McCoy's, I can contact the Pig Bar or, you know, any other, you know, LaVoyer or any other venue here in Olympia. And, you know, they have a direct, you know, uh, relationship with me. So they may, you know, they may or may not, you know, respond to your email. But if you if you contact me, they'll more than likely respond to an email from me in, in a quicker manner. Right. It's not as much of just uh, cold calling if they go through you. Exactly. So you're, yeah. you're not and employed by any of the venues in any way uh, that, that you're reaching out to. It's just you're a name they recognize. Exactly. Yeah. They, they know that I'm going to put in the work to make sure that, you know, the, the time slots are written out that, you know, the bands, you know, are properly uh, backlining, you know, drums, amps, you know, such, you know, little minor details like that, that, you know, some people who aren't used to throwing shows on a regular basis, uh, you know, they might forget to ask these questions and, you know. Yeah, totally. So are there other the, it, book booking is sometimes more than just getting the show it can also include negotiating like the door prices or maybe some bands get a, a bigger split of the take home money. Are you also doing that for bands or do you leave, leave that to the artists themselves generally? Uh, yeah, uh, I usually what, what happens is, uh, I guess, in a, a normal scenario, like, you know, 2019, early 2020, um, a normal scenario would be a touring band hits me up. They say, hey, we're on tour from Vancouver, B.C., and we're looking to, to play this date. And what I'll offer them usually is 50 percent of the door. And then, you know, the rest of it will be split, but be, be will be split between the uh, the local bands, essentially. Gotcha. And I usually try to I usually try to give the bigger cut to the band that's on tour because, you know, the show wouldn't be happening if it weren't for them. Right, right. Um, is this a service you charge for? Do, do, do you do bands pay pay you to book, book these shows for them? Uh, it's usually 10 percent. 10 percent is like the, the common like that's like the normal price for a, a DIY promoter, from my understanding, at least. And, you know, like other booking agents, too. I've talked it over with them and, you know, it can vary anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of whatever's made gotcha and then are so promotion's also a big part part of this business are you also like kind of overseeing poster design or have or hang, hanging posters around town what what all goes into maybe making the show the best it can be because if you're getting 10 percent, you want to do as much to maximize your profit and make the show and make the show go as well too obviously Definitely. Actually, speaking on that, shout out to Last Word Books, because uh, that's where I used to get my uh, flyers printed. I mean, they're uh -huh. still around, thankfully. But um, yeah, I I did I miss it so much. But yeah, uh, you know, I would often ask, it, it, usually it's the touring band that hits me up. So I'll ask, hey, am I responsible for the flyer or are you? And if they're responsible for the flyer, then I need to make sure that, that it has my logo on it. And then from there, we can, yeah, once, once the flyer is made, though, then I can actually like print it out and then distribute it, you know, all over town here. We have a Evergreen State College. So that's like, you know, the, the first place I go to flyer. And then on top of that, downtown Olympia. And then we also, uh, I, I do try to focus on a uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know, the normal stuff. And, you know, I'll tell the local bands, Hey, send out your invites on Facebook, you know, post on Twitter, post on Instagram, hashtag Olympia, all that good junk. Yeah, it's yeah. the minor details. <laughs> you, you mentioned bands are normally reaching out to you. Do you ever reach out to bands and say like, hey, but I heard your stuff. I really want to put together an awesome show for you. Definitely. It's been more so like a Bellingham, uh, Seattle, Portland bands because, uh, you know, Olympia is like a smaller place. Mm -hmm. But I've definitely, you know, reached out. And especially uh, right before the pandemic hit, I got an actual job where I actually got a check for, 
you know, booking bands. Like it was my responsibility to book, you know, four nights of the week. So I was reaching out to, you know, a lot of the bigger names who I thought, you know, would have pull here at Olympia and, you know, you know what happened in March of 2020, everything just fell apart. So. Oh, I'm very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, at this, at this time, that's partially why I started the podcast is I sort of want to reach out to these, you know, these, these band members or these, you know, artists and, you know, uh, have them, have them voice their opinions on what's going on and such. Like if we can't have them perform on the stage, I at least want people to know who they are. Right. It's fine. It's kind of, I, I'm not always super comfortable in front of a, like a podcast microphone, but it's a similar reason why I started this podcast and that a lot of musicians, they were able to adapt fairly well to live streams. They can start, uh, they put out a virtual tip jar and people can play shows, but there's a lot of other people involved in the industry, people like yourself. So they kind of, it felt like a lot of them disappeared. People who do sound at shows or promote shows or um, lighting people just who there's so much more of the music industry. So getting the chance to talk to people like you and see how you were affected by the pandemic is interesting as well. It sounds like you found a way to adapt to it in, in mm-hmm. a way that's, uh, it, I'm, I'm, I know it's not the same, but hopefully it brings you some of that same creative spark that you get from playing shows. That's exactly it. Like the thing that really bugs me is that there are people out there who are like, Oh, we can't play live. So I guess I'm just not going to do anything. And I'm like, yo, we've, we have the technology, like let's utilize this. Like let's keep ourselves busy. So we, so when things do run back up, we're not like, I forgot how to do everything, you know, you know, I just got to keep the wheels turning. That's, that's all I keep telling myself. Yeah. Uh, so when, when did you start the, the podcast you're doing? How, how, how shortly uh, after the pandemic did that begin? I started it in August of 2020. But before you and were doing was, that, or so go ahead. Oh, no. And it was just more so uh, I was, uh, you know, focused on, you know, Olympia musicians. But, uh, you know, as the, as the COVID numbers started rising, you know, people didn't want to meet up with me and which is, you know, understandable. And um, yeah, so I've just been doing a Zoom call uh, interviews for the time being. And then, yeah, once the numbers start to go back down again, then I can start, you know, going back to my community members and being like, hey, I actually do miss you and miss talking to you. And, you know, I want your voice on my on my platform. Right. Well, I was reading. So before you started this podcast, where were you doing all that talk, talking to bands and uh, other people in the Olympia music scene? I was reading in 2018 that you started uh, an hour long radio show called uh, on Free Radio Olympia. Is that still ongoing? Uh, that is not, uh, okay. actually be, yeah, because of COVID. Yeah. Free radio Olympia hasn't been, you know, allowing DJs into their studio. Gotcha. The, their website was kind of hard to navigate. You were still on your schedule, but I hadn't seen you post about it for a while. So I wasn't sure that's good to get that clarified, but, um, yeah, both on, on your podcast, I listened to a few episodes and just talking to you now, you seem comfortable on a mic. I'm curious, like as a podcast host and like and working in radio, do you get that kind of performers itch the same way you do like when you perform music, we'll get to that later because I know you used to perform music as well. Well, uh, I I used to rap. Uh, That's actually how I got into promotion. And yeah, in a weird way, like being behind a microphone again in this, in this way, it's, it's actually kind of uncomfortable really realistically because like, it's not really my passion. My passion is putting together lineups, you know, you know, getting a hit up by a touring band and, you know, me, you know, working the wheels in my head and saying, Oh, you sound like, you know, this band and this band, you guys, you know, would go great on a bill. You know, I think that you would sonically sound best at O'Malley's or the pig bar or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not the same as performing, which, uh, you know, I think I just found my place personally. I'm not really the biggest fan of making music as I am just, you know, attending a show or, you know, helping make it, you know, run smooth and such. Cool. You're touching on a bunch of things I had written down that I don't want to talk on, uh, but you're talking about kind of pairing bands with certain uh, other bands or certain venues. Uh, you were mentioning Lavoyer, Le- Le- McCoy's Cavern, O'Malley's Lounge, Cascadia Brewing Co., the Pig Bar, Lucky Liquor, Westside Langs, uh, uh, Octopass. I-, I saw all these venues and was curious, are there distinct qualities about certain venues that make you think this band is a, the best fit for for this venue and like is there a way to kind of um yeah kind of qualify what makes certain venues a better fit for certain bands 
I like this question. Thank yeah. you. Um, so I guess first things first, if it's a metal show or a hardcore punk show, it doesn't belong at a place like say Octopus, like you said, or, or the pig bar really. Okay. Um, uh, you know, McCoy's McCoy's Tavern, uh, the Cryptotropa is another spot here in Olympia and Lavoyer. They all host, you know, metal and punk shows and, you know, the louder stuff. And even Westside Lane, you know, we've done some metal shows there and they've been fun. Um, but like, say it's, you know, a country band, uh, Lavoyer or McCoy's aren't really like the spots, you know, to host a country show. Uh, the, I've thrown some country shows at the pig bar, you know, it's more of that scene. And even, even then though, uh, indie, you know, just plain indie rock or just, you know, garage rock or whatever, that'll go find it any venue really in Olympia. And is this just kind of based on what the bookers and owners of these clubs have kind of decided what they want their vibe to be? Or, For sure. Because yeah. I know like yeah. there, there's some places we play where there's no internal audience. It's just who, if, uh, where so, some places uh, there are regulars at a bar that happens to have music. So, you know, they're coming for a thing they know is going to be there. But then there are other clubs where... There, there aren't regulars. People are coming to see the band. So theoretically, you could put like almost any any music at that club, and then the fans of that band will gravitate towards it. Definitely, yeah. I just, uh, I feel like you know, like I mentioned, uh, the Pig Bar. It's not, it's not really a spot for. It, it's sort of a smaller spot. So if you have a, a metal show in there, it's just going to echo and it's not going to sound good. And also, you know, they do have an older clientele, but that older clientele you know, we'll listen to, you know, dream pop or, you know, uh, indie rock too. And yeah. So the people sort of know what to expect, especially a place like McCoy's, you know, if, if it's going to, if there's going to be a metal show at McCoy's, everybody in town knows about it. Yeah. Cool. Well, are there any other philosophies you have when putting a show together when with my band, I'm sorry to keep bringing us, but we have a lot of the same experience here. So everything's in reference to my experience as I'm asking you these questions. But no when, we, when we book shows, our, our kind of theory is that we want to play shows with people who sound like us and hope that their fans are also a fan of us. Is that kind of the way you do things? Or do you think there's a benefit to having maybe extreme diversity on a bill where maybe you wouldn't think a country band and a punk band go together on the same bill? Maybe not that combo, but you know what I mean? Not that particular combo, but uh, just listening to your stuff, uh, it was it was high crime, right? Correct. Yeah. I'm just making sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just making sure I didn't get my people mixed up here. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Hi. Yeah. High crime. I could definitely see on a bill with a uh, arena. Uh, that's a local band here. I could see them on a bill with a uh, uh, pigtails. That's another indie rock band. Uh, Blue Wisteria just moved away, but they would, they would be perfect for y'all. Uh, GMO might be a little garage rocky, so they would probably be more sonically. They'd fit last on the bill with you. If you were the, the touring band that hit me up, I would put y'all in the middle and then I'd put GMO last. Um, we love the middle spot generally. We feel like the pe people who are there to see the first band, they'll stick around to see a few songs of the second band and people come early for the last band. So I feel like the middle spot often gets the most audience unless the headliner is a big deal headliner. Right, right. And then uh, even so, uh, you know, I, I have no problem with putting like solo artists to, to open a show personally, yep. whether it's folk or or hip hop really. Cause uh, I've thrown some, some punk shows where I'll throw a hip hop artist to open the show. And it's sort of, it just gets the vibe. It gets people a little loose. It's not what people are expecting when you have, you know, three punk bands and then, you know, you have a, a hip hop artist opening up the show. Yeah. Did you say you also do some house show booking uh, out, outside of like traditional venues? Uh, so Olympia is pretty infamous for our house show scene. Right. And I, yeah, I have booked a few shows at uh, the ABC house, and uh, I do want to give a shout-out to Dean of the Hobbit Hole. Uh, R.I.P. the Hobbit name. Hole, though. Yeah. R.I.P. the Hobbit Hole, though. I do miss those cats. Uh, yeah, they had to move away, and, you know, without with COVID and all, you know, they, they're they not throwing shows. They're not active anymore. But, um, yeah, house, house shows really pop off here in Olympia. It's really a love-hate, though, just because uh, the, the major problem with, with house shows is, you know, you advertise to a bunch of broke college kids. So they show up with an 18 pack and they're like, Oh, we don't have any money. And, uh, so yeah, you, you'll get a lot of fans out of the deal, but you won't make a lot of money. That's, you know, that's the harsh truth. That that's a fair trade for, for a lot of musicians, I think. Um, cause like that, that's the spot where I could actually see 
a, a band like myself going to a DIY concert promoter, we don't have, I, I know of maybe two or three kind of house show spots in Seattle, but if we were to go outside Seattle, I, I don't know anything about house shows. So I could see going to someone like you to book that. Um, <laughs> oh, well, so house shows, house shows. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so are, are there yeah, – you, you mentioned that uh, you know, you'll probably make less money, but you'll have different kind of fans show up at them. Is that the biggest difference mm-hmm. between like a, a house show or a traditional club show is? Or I, I, I know and it's it, a very special vibe. I just kind of want to hear you talk about what what the, the different vibes are if you're able to. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, a house show is BYOB, so that's super convenient. I don't have to wait in line and spend, you know, seven bucks on a beer. Um you know, uh, but other than that, it's, yeah, it's just a nice vibe. It's more like, it's more like a party, you know, it's not, right. Hey, we're going to a show where we pay to cover and we have to stay here to see everybody, you know, to see all the bands. It's more like, it's more like, yeah, just a party. Let's vibe together. Let's, let's hang out. And, you know, uh, it's usually tip based. So, you know, it's always nice to, you know, go around with the tip jar and, you know, say like, Hey, you know, throw 20 bucks in here for the touring band and such. And it's, yeah, it's more like community knit in a, in a way. Right. That'd like be the that. best way to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, so most traditional bookers, if you're working at any kind of club club or small theater, they, they have to say no to a lot of people for variety of reasons. So sometimes maybe a band just has no audience and the bar is going to lose money if they don't bring in an audience. Um, what makes you have to say no to people or, or, or have, cause I'm sure you, you do, you're, you're not, if someone reaches out to you, you're not always going to say, yes, I will get you a show. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Like I've, I've learned about new genres of music as a result of becoming a booker, but it's that, that doesn't mean I like everything. And right. that's the, <laughs> Oh my God, you're, uh, you're making me miss it. Like, this is the one part I don't miss about it. You know, I've talked to other bookers and we're like, don't you, don't you just not miss this one thing? And I (laughs) don't miss having to tell people like, Hey, you're, you're not the right sound that we're looking for. And it's especially rough when people are like, well, what about, you know, what if you book me at this venue instead of that venue? And I'm like, it's just, you're not the right sound that we're looking for. Does that, is, is that a soft way of putting it? Does that just mean you think they suck or, or what, or do you just think they, they're not going to fit for that venue? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, in the scenario of if they suck and, yeah. um, you know, if, I uh, you know, if a, if a band is sonically good, but like, I look at their numbers and, you know, they've got less than a thousand plays on Spotify or they've only got like 30 likes on Facebook, then what I might tell them is, Hey, if y'all want to come down here on like a Monday or a Tuesday, you know, and then we can work out like, you know, and we can see if we can actually build you an audience. If there's somebody that I actually want to put the effort into, then I'll, I'll be happy to, Mm -hmm. but it has to be sonic. It has to sonically be there. It has to like get, it has to really like move me to make me actually want to go out of my way to say, Hey, I can, I can book y'all here in Olympia on an off night. Right. That makes sense. That seems like a good (laughs) way of doing it. Um, I haven't spent a whole lot of time in Olympia. I've seen one or two shows down there, but you've been very well versed in the scene. How is it different from this overwhelming kind of Seattle scene? I'm sure people just can conflate the two, but there are differences surely between Olympia and Seattle or, or any surrounding. There's probably differences between Bellingham and Bainbridge. So can you talk, what is, what are some of the overwhelming qualities about Olympia's music scene? See, that's, that's an interesting question. Cause, uh, I, I guess, uh, the major differences is, is, you know, the, the amount of venues, um, for, for how big Seattle is, y'all have a lot of venues. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, for how small Olympia is, we technically do have a lot of venues and that can be, you know, a gift and a curse, you know, cause you would have 10 shows to choose from here in Olympia or 10 shows to choose from in Seattle, but your, your population is so much bigger that right. it makes sense that y'all have 10 shows to choose from us. We have 10 shows to choose from. So that means, you know, two or three of those shows are not going to be well attended at all. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm trying to think like uh, Bellingham is awesome because it's a college town where people actually, I guess, have money, I guess is the best way to put it. Like here in Olympia, it's, it's very low income. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's, there's not as many opportunities here versus a place like Bellingham. And, uh, 
Does that I've reflect never had any musically problem. at all? A, a low-income place having the different music. I'm like, maybe, maybe like, uh, you, you probably won't get huge like, kind of jazz brass bands because those instruments and often there's like formal training and stuff that goes into it that all costs money. So like, is there a musical reflection of that? Whether it's a lot, uh, so a lot what, of punk things or I, I don't know. Yeah, no, the the punk and metal scene are huge around these parts. Um, you know, if there was really one genre that didn't do so well, it would be hip hop. And that's actually why I branched out of just throwing hip hop shows. I've had better luck in, in other markets other than Olympia, as far as like hip hop goes. But I mean, it's, that's not to say that there aren't hip hop artists here that bring people out. Uh, you know, London Wolf is a great example. Um, uh, Astro Bodies, uh, Orange Goodman, Northwest Wave. I mean, they all have pull, but I've, I've had to decline a lot of hip hop artists just because I've looked at their numbers and just said, look, it's not going to be easy for me to market this. But um, back to your question though. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're home of riot or yeah. Riot girls. And you know, oh, right. uh, a lot of fem, a lot of femme punk. So, you know, that, that tends to be what people, you know, navigate towards Yeah, here in Olympia. I, I like what you were saying about having to say no to certain people, even if you support what they're doing, but like if they can't bring on audience, it's also a reflection on you. You're putting your name and, and weight behind this show. So if it fails it, yeah, it, it yeah, I guess you lose some kind of public trust in, in the, with the bookers and venues of the shows you're booking shows at and, and people who want to come see your shows, if they think it's kind of a bust, you know, that sucks. Yeah. Uh, and it's so funny because, you know, sometimes I'll say, you know, I'll have to tell them like, Hey, the night's not available at this spot. They don't really do, or like this spot doesn't do hip hop shows. And a lot of artists will get salty. Like, Oh, that place doesn't do hip hop. And I'm like, well, it doesn't sell well. <laughs> right. Or like, yeah. Or like, I've heard the complaint of like, you know, like, Oh, a fight broke out at a hip hop show at this place. So we're not going to throw hip hop shows again. That's never happened here that I've seen. At least I've never heard of a venue in Olympia say, we don't want a hip hop show because of a fight. Hmm. It's always yeah. been for other reasons. Gotcha. Well, we touched on it a little bit earlier that you used to be, be involved in hip hop. You, you were an MC, uh, and I was listening to, I think it was the inaugural podcast of the, the podcast you started in the summer, where you said you started Cap City Presents as a means to network and hopefully get you more stage time as a performer, but you're no longer interested in creating music. Um, so when you were an MC, I'm, I'm curious, what were your lyrics about? Did you have a message you wanted to get out there as a performer? Uh, I was a stoner. I uh -huh. like to rap about smoking weed, I guess. That was like really my go-to. Um, yeah, I just, you know, thinking of back to it. I mean, I still have an album. It's on Bandcamp. If you <laughs> if you look up remix.bandcamp.com, it's still there. I mean, I just haven't done anything since then. Um, yeah, it was just a bunch of smoking weed songs for the most part. Uh, a lot of like, I, I grew up on a lot of like, uh, you know, West Coast gangster rap and, you know, like what what people would consider like emo rap in like the early two thousands. So a lot of like, you know, atmosphere, brother Ali idea, um, you know, a lot of like sad stuff. So, you know, it was, it was a variety, I guess, between the two. Gotcha. Uh, this is a weird question, but I was thinking about it myself. I've had, uh, some musicians on this podcast who I'm a fan of. And, uh, I, I, I was liking, I, I enjoyed talking to them, but, I realize even though they're a great musician, they don't make good podcast guests. There are some musicians who just, they're very, they don't talk much or they give short answers or they don't know how to talk about their art that much. Do you do any research into how, you, uh, what guests you want to choose to talk to on your podcast? Or is it just, if I'm a fan of this person, I want to talk to them. Um, I guess it's a, a mix of uh, two different things. You know, I, I get contacted by people like such as yourself, uh, you know, and they'll ask like, Hey, can I be on the podcast? And if I really like them and dig them, then yeah, I'll do that. Like, a, you know, Jason McHugh, he, oh, yeah, he, he was me the first up. guest on this uh, show. Awesome. Okay, sweet. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, when he had hit me up and I, I knew his name, but I didn't, I wasn't familiar with his music, but after giving a listen, I was like, well, fuck yeah, I want you on my show, you know? And then, um, you know, when I first started this, I, you know, sort of reached out to, you know, my, my old rap buddies, you know, uh, Colin McGee, who's the uh, president of Forum C's by MC's, Afrock, uh, Double B. They, they've all been putting it down here in the scene for years and years. So obviously they're, you know, they're 
I, I've known them for 10 years. They're people that I can converse with and, you know, like have a full on conversation, you know, to, you know, to, to get some good content, to hear some good stories and such. And then, uh, as far as like reaching out to other people, um, you know, I did an episode with Mac and gold who I just found out about her on Instagram and I was like, wow, her music's dope. So I just reached out and just decided on that. Yeah, very cool. Um, so going back to this, all these shows you, you put on, how do you evaluate the shows that you put all this work into, uh, get, getting bands lined up at the venue? You've put, put the order of bands together. Hopefully there's been a great audience turnout. How do, how do you evaluate if a show is a success or a failure? What's, what do you need to improve on? Is it all about the audience turnout or what, how, how do you decide if a show was good or, or you need to improve? I think uh, first things first, or like first and foremost, I think the bar, you know, the bar is really relying on me to bring people to buy drinks, to buy food, you know, such, you know, things like that. So that's virtually my job is as a promoter is to get people to come in and spend money. So there is success in that. I guess, I guess there are multiple tiers to the success because like, yes, there's success there, but then there's also, uh, you know, did the band's sound good you know like was the sound you know like was the sound good was the band you know were they engaging were people like not turned off by them um what else goes into success yeah i guess uh overall if the uh touring band had a good time as well you know like i guess people's happiness is like Number one, what, and also, you know, I've, I've said this a million times to other promoters, you know, like our job as a promoter is to make sure that, you know, to ensure the safety of people there. Oh, so it, yeah. So as long as everything was done safely, everything sounded good. The bar had great sales. You know, there's multiple things to measure as far as like whether or not a, a show is successful. Yeah. I, I like, I, I like that one, one of the current themes in this conversation is you keep on talking about like ma making sure that, uh, the bands are happy, especially the touring bands, because they're kind of a fish out of water if they're coming through Olympia. Uh, right. Uh, most touring bands, they're not going to have a place to stay. Do you, I'm sure you get tons of people asking you, like, do you know anyone who, like, we can sleep on their couch or floor? Uh, do, do you handle that? Do you have people you can put them in touch with? So, uh, God, I want to give a shout out to my boys, uh, Chris and Riley, because I lived at a party house, you know, in my late twenties and uh -huh. God, we, so, you know, it was not out of the ordinary for me to, to group check, to group text all of them. Like, Hey, can like five dudes from the Midwest stay on our couches? And we had four couches. Like I said, it was a party house. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it could, it could have been a Monday. It could have been a Wednesday, a Saturday. We had people over on a regular basis. So, you know, it wasn't out of the ordinary for me to be like, Oh, I've got four couches. The rest of y'all can sleep on the floor. And they're more than happy. They're just like thankful that it's like, you know, a spot with a roof that they can just like sleep for five hours before getting back on the road. I, I imagine that goes off without a hitch most times. So have you had any disaster stories of bands who just did not respect the space? You don't have to name I, I, names, but it, it, it's, it's a, it's a public trust thing where you're inviting people into your home, strangers. And yeah. So uh, you're, you're making me think of one story in particular, and I am going to say their name just because it's, it's really funny. Like I can laugh about this now and I want to visit them at some point. So uh, I'm actually, my partner is also a booker as well. So, uh, you know, we, at, at the new spot that I'm at right now, um, you know, we, we have a day bed, we've got a couch here, the couch that I'm sitting on. And, um, there, there were times where we had a roommate who did work early and, uh, you know, like them unloading and loading, you know, things out of the car, they can be loud. So yeah, it's going to be like a, the worst. after midnight, what, 1am uh, when, yeah. yeah. So, and yeah. they're, you know, bringing in their heavy amps because they don't want to get them stolen out of their car or whatever. And, uh, there was one night in particular though, shout out to the band Tanglers, uh, based in, a uh, Vancouver, BC, because they, uh, one of their members just got too turnt and, uh, was puking in our front yard. So we were just like, dude, you need to like get your boy back in here. My roommates pissed at me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not mad. I'm not mad at them. It's more of a funny story, but at the time I was just kind of like, yo, like, stop <laughs> <laughs> right um but that's the only like bad thing i can think of as far as like people sleeping at my spot like i guess like the worst part is like when they'll say like hey do you have a spot for us to crash and then i say yes but then it ends up being like five more people than i thought 
Oh yeah, that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Uh, well, one thing we were talking about earlier when we were talking about promoting shows, you mentioned you'll th throw it up on all the social media and, and word of mouth, talking to people, just texting people, hey, come out to this show. I think it's going to be cool. Um, is Do you ever do paid promotion? I, I've never done much paid promotion for my shows. I, I'm wondering if it's effective at all, What if you get the return on investment. Do you have any experience with e either making it an Instagram an ad or, yeah, I don't know. It depends. It just depends on how big that show is. Cause like, you know, a, a lot of the DIY promoting I do, it's from bands that don't have much pull yeah. and it just doesn't seem to be very effective to, you know, spend 30 bucks on a sponsored ad saying bands that you've never heard of is performing here. And, you know, people will look at that and be like, Oh, okay. Like whatever. But like, say for example, uh, one of the bigger names that I booked was a slug Christ. So of course, you know, I'm going to drop an extra 20 to 30 bucks on sponsored ads just to make sure that those that niche market of people who didn't know about the show will just be scrolling on their Facebook or their Instagram and then see like, Oh shit, slug, slug Christ is coming to town. Yeah. And it's one of those things where you can't, you don't have a side by side where you can't have two shows, one where you promote and one where you don't and see if it made a difference or not. But, yeah, right. I, I'm always I mean, it's kidding, all, yeah. it's all gambling at the end of the day. I often will joke. Yeah. I'm not really a big fan of gambling. That's why I'm a concert promoter. <laughs> that's kind of funny because i've thought the same thing where we've maybe, maybe we'll pay someone a few bucks to like design a poster for us and then we pay 20 bucks to print out posters and then spend time hanging around hanging them around town and i think nobody is coming to the show because they saw us on a poster but then every once in a while i'll hear someone say like oh we were just walking and thought hey let's check out a show they see a poster and they come in so right like, is that just one anecdote where it happened or does it actually make a difference it depends on the person too, because uh, I don't know about you, but I'm the type of person that will, you know, uh, the Lavoyer used to be my second home, you know, before the shutdowns and everything. So it wasn't uncommon for me to go in there, grab a beer after work. And, uh, what's unique about there is that they do two shows a night. So it's six to 10, all ages. And then seven or sorry, uh, 10 and on is a uh, 21 and up. So, you know, I'd go in there, you know, after work, you know, it'd be like, six o'clock at night and I'd see a band loading in and I'd just be like, okay, well I'll check you out, you know, or, you know, like, like you said, like I'll be walking down the street and be like, Oh, I know that local band that's on that bill. Maybe it's worth checking out this show. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. You, you've mentioned some of these cl clubs that you've booked at L L Lavoyer and so on. Have, have you heard anything publicly about like what, if any venues are, gone for good because of COVID. They just don't have the money to open back up. Is the scene going to change a lot when shows can happen again in, in that way? It definitely will. Um, so Octop has um, actually moved locations. So it's not like they closed like for good, but also they, are, they, they aren't obviously bringing their event space with. So it's just going to be a restaurant. And I mean, they're open now. But yeah, uh, Octop is just currently a restaurant. So we don't know if they're going to be able to even like handle hosting shows. Um, sadly, rhythm and rye has to move as well, but that's another bigger spot here in town that fits about 250 people. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's and, significant. Yeah. And I mean, the rest of the spots here in town, you know, fit anywhere between like a hundred and 200. So yeah, rhythm and rye having to move that space is going to be tough, but, um, yeah, I, I hope that they pull through according to Andy, shout out Andy. Um, he's, he's he's making it work he's looking at some some other spots but uh, as far as i know i don't think that there's going to be too many spots that are are gone for good as a result of COVID. that's good to hear i haven't heard of too many in seattle as well and, and the ones that are i think they're trying to figure out a way to make it happen again they, they want to keep keep the dream alive very very persistent bunch of creative people so it's good to hear that i like that you mm -hmm. were saying uh Lavoyer has two shows a night and they have oh, some all ages shows. We don't have that many all ages venues in Seattle. Is that pre pretty good in Olympia being able to have shows where ev everyone can come and it's a good space? It's give and take. Um, you know, like you had asked me before, like, you know, when I decide like, Hey, where does this show fit the best? Right. Personally, weekend shows or sorry, not weekend, uh, weekday shows. I personally like to throw them at Lavoyer for the early for the early spot because it's sort of an Olympia thing where we all know that 
the show starts at seven and it has to end by 10 for yeah. legality purposes. And yeah, uh, you know, I, I work a nine to five just like everybody else. So it's nice to, you know, 10 o'clock rolls around. It's like, okay, well, the show's over. Now I have time to actually like go home and get to bed and, you know, don't have to rush it or whatever. Uh, but, um, all ages shows are very, yeah, they're, they're, we go hand in hand a lot. I mean, I tried, I try, I wish that I could make all the shows, uh, all ages, but obviously that's not the case. Um, well, what, yeah, I, 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 I sometimes just, wonder what, what's the biggest barrier. So if you have, uh, in all ages shows that basically all ages means that they're not going to serve alcohol there. Right. Or, or if, or if they do serve alcohol, you need to hire someone else to check IDs at the door and be very, and like corral people into different areas. Uh, Lavoyer, I'm not sure how the legality works of it, but as long as they sell the the beer in the bar, then yeah, you're fine to bring it back there. Mm-hmm. I don't really understand the legalities of it, but yeah, they it is legal to do that, and they did the same thing at a uh, Octopus as well. You were allowed to buy the the drinks in the bar. And take them in with you, and it's it's up to the discretion of the door person. Gotcha. So it's yeah, it's more so the door person's responsibility to make sure that everybody's you know complying with the laws. Yeah. Well, let's get into the future making business here. Uh, COVID's done. Shows can happen. Um, how does it go? What happens? What what changes? I guess both for you as someone uh, and kind of the behind the scenes of the industry, and just yeah, overall, are there things you are worried about, or do you think people are going to come flocking back to shows? Just walk me through, because I'm sure you've thought about it a lot. As soon as I can get back to making shows happen, how do I do it? What changes? So I, I'm, I'm so confused as to what is the right answer, because I'm going to actually follow this up with a question for you, yeah. because, um, because I, I've, I've been asked uh, about, you know, like, Hey, would you feel comfortable booking some, some bar shows, you know, like as long as they're outside. So then I reach out to, you know, my Olympia community and it's very 50, 50. It's very like, hell yeah, I want to perform outside and I'll happily do that. You know? So, you know, people can, you know, so there's like airflow. So we're not like in a, in a bar where just people are like close quarters. And then there's that 50% of people who are just like, you're a murderer. How dare you? And I don't know what the right answer is for this. So I, I'm almost thinking better safe than sorry. I think we should just start booking. Like, I think I'll start hitting up bands and being like, Hey, let's start in December. Yeah. And let's say hypothetically it is safe before December. Well, what's the worst case scenario. I just have all of December booked out and then we can, you know, work on November next. And then that actually makes me want to follow up this question with you, you as a, a band member, when do you think you'll feel like safe to go back to shows? There's something in me that's optimistic about this summer. Maybe late this summer. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't just the uh, I because I know me like I'm I'm a healthy guy in my twenties. I've no, I'm not an essential worker. I don't have any kind of uh, l- l- like like health issues. And from what I've been reading, following up on, that this summer maybe early summer is about the time that I'm eligible to get the vaccine. So maybe uh, within a few weeks after that, a lot of people my age and in my same like kind of low priority for the vaccine things will be vaccinated and hopefully we'll be at that herd immunity mark where people can go to shows and they'll probably still be masked still. But um, Mm -hmm. it seems like a pretty safe bet to uh, hopefully mid to late summer. I'm thinking if vaccine rollout continues to be strong, a lot of people will be able to yeah, be, be vaccinated by then. Yeah, see, that's what I'm thinking as well. I like uh, so from what I'm from my understanding from the research I've done, it seems like late August should be when vaccines will be available for everybody. And like right. you said, I like you said, uh, you know, I think we sh- we we should be able to start booking in the fall. And you know, obviously, masks will still be required. And I would probably more so try to to book, you know, like solo artists or duos, mm-hmm. just so it's not like a band of like five people on stage, you know, hypothetically all of them singing at the same time, spitting on the crowd or whatever on accident, you know? Right. Um, It's not so much the the bodies in the room. Cause I think like you walk in any grocery store, there may be, I don't know, 70 plus people in a grocery store mingling around. They're all wearing masks and it's fine. There doesn't seem to be much transmission there, 
but like uh, <laughs> with performers, you you probably are spitting on mics, and those are then being touched by the sound guys and other singers and other bands are adjusting it. So there's for the performers, it probably feels less safe than for the audience. Maybe I don't know. And plus, when you mix people with alcohol, they do irrational things. Like I, even the bars are open now, and you can like look at you know groups of people, and they're just like they they don't seem to care. Like when sure. you know you, they get a couple of beers in them, and then they're just like, "Oh, come here, let me hug you, let me just breathe on you for a second, you know. Yeah, the thing I'm really curious about is there's going to be competition for spots more than there ever has been before. Venues are hurting for money, and what they're going to be doing in my this is the theory I've been running through my head. Every major artist, like huge artists out there, they're going to be wanting to get back on the road as soon as possible because they haven't been able to do it for over a year. So right. venues, they're going to like every arena and big theater and large club is going to be booked by the people with the biggest draws because they and there's going to be so then people will be going down to smaller venues. And I think really small local regional acts will kind of be pushed out of the mix because they don't have the audience necessarily to guarantee a big turnout and just everyone everyone wants to get back to shows where at any given time maybe say 20 to 30 percent of bands they're not actively playing shows they're working on albums they're on writing retreats i think everyone's going to want to get out there at the same time so trying trying to get spots is going to become very competitive and i'm curious how that's going to work i i have been reaching out to to specific bands myself just being like, Hey, would you feel comfortable performing in a, for a December show in, yeah. in Olympia? And I've been getting mixed reviews, but the, the ones who are saying yes, I'm for, just sort for of December like 2021. Yeah. Is that what, okay. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. And yeah. like I mentioned, you know, like, let's say I'm just sort of thinking to myself better safe than sorry. Like what if I start booking December and then we realize, Oh, it's actually safe to do it before December. Oh, well, I see. I see. Book, got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, let's book November. Let's book October. Uh, you know, under the conditions yeah. that it is actually, you know, like everybody will have a a vaccine available to them and such. Yeah, cool. If you were to ask me December, I would always think, yeah, that there will definitely be shows by December. And yeah, that's been that's been most people, but I have gotten a few people that are just like, ah, I don't really know yet, and I'm like, that's fine because you know this was only supposed to last two weeks. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, yeah. I think it'll, it, may, it may be kind of like that where the first thing was like events over 250 people, though those are banned. And, and then the next day was events with, with more than 50 people are gone. And then it was just like everything gone. So I think they're like the shows that you and I perform at will be the ones that kind of start first, like the the 200 plus people shows they may be a few weeks or months after small bars where you have 50 people in there. Right. So yeah, I think we'll kind of be the, yeah, the, the guinea pigs for this with the very small bands and small shows. Definitely. Interesting. Cool. Well, it's been so much fun talking about all this stuff. I am curious, uh, what did you bring for show and tell? For show and tell, I brought this potato because I just think they're neat. Which is a really bad Simpsons joke because I was like, what do I bring for show and tell? And I was like, bring a potato. It's uh, that, that, that's what Marge says, right? Yes, yeah. There's an episode of The Simpsons. I'm a Simpsons nerd, by the way. I'm surprised you didn't ask me any questions about The Simpsons. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, no, I'm a Simpsons nerd. So like, you asked me to bring something for show and tell, and I'm like, I should bring a potato. I just think they're neat. But uh, on the real, though, I did bring... Well, well, well before we get to the real thing, uh, what... Well... Just on on the fly, what makes potatoes neat for you? This, like, <laughs> this, this is like no. debate debate prep. Did you have thirty seconds? What makes a potato neat? I think you could think oh, of a man. couple of things that make them interesting. Are are, are they a root I, vegetable? Is that what they are? I don't know much about. Yeah, them. they're a root vegetable. I mean, I was <laughs> I was more so just thinking of from the perspective of Marge because I was like, what do I bring for show and tell? Uh, what what is no, neat I, about I'm, potatoes? I'm challenge you on this. I bet yeah, there's got to be some cool fun facts about them. I mean, they're versatile. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're easy to cook. I mean, I may not be hungry now, but I, I'll be hungry in an hour, so I can just throw it in the oven and call it good. Um, I love sweet potatoes. Some people are very anti-sweet potatoes. Uh, what, I'm not anti-sweet at? potato, but they're not my favorite. Gotcha. I like home fries. Home fries are great. Uh, uh, preferred, or, uh, preferred, no, steak fries. 
preferred condiments uh, with like French fries. What, what do you go with? Uh, I really like, you know, pink sauce or, uh, you know, like, um, like so, mayo and uh, ketchup. Got That'd it, be got my it. go-to. And then there's also a uh, stuff called goop, which is like a, a thing that Olympians add on our burgers. Uh, there's a spot called Egan's and also big Tom's. They got the side of goop that come with your burgers. So I like dipping my fries in goop. Cool. All right. Well, you've got, is that a bowling ball you have in front of you? What, what is this a real show and tell item you have here? Yes, this is a, uh, a bowling ball. Um, I was in a bowling league for quite a few years, and that's how I learned how to do this uh, this trick. Let's see if I can do this here. I'm just going to move my mic out of the way here. Okay. Let's see. Well, here, I can do it while sitting. It's just a really dumb trick that I learned how to do when I was a kid. Oh, that's fantastic. Can can you do it the uh, that that's impressive enough if you can't do this but can you do it the opposite way? I cannot do it the opposite way. Okay, fair <laughs> I'm enough. Not that cool. uh, yeah. I am yeah. But um, I did bring this for context just because it's a medicine ball and it actually does have the weight on it. That's a 15 okay. pound ball and I mean haters will say it's photoshop but um yeah, this is 10 pounds and I just want to sort of prove myself here. Yeah. Boom. Nice. So, so who, who taught you. you this trick? You said you learned it, or is it just something you saw someone else do? So, uh, I don't know if you remember when like, and one DVDs were really popular back in the day, like back in the early 2000s. I don't know if I know what that is. Okay. Yeah. And one is okay. like, they're, they're a shoe brand and they used okay. to have like, you know, street ball DVDs where these people, it'd be like the Harlem Globetrotters charters, essentially, okay. you know, they'd have, you know, people, you know, doing cool tricks with basketballs. And I just remember seeing somebody, you know, doing that with a basketball. And I thought, you know, I, w I played basketball when I was younger too. So I was like, I'll try that, you know, and I started doing it and I was like, huh, I can do this like really easily. But I was also in a bowling league. So I picked up a six pound bowling ball one day and I was just like, this is really light. I wonder if I could do it. And I just practiced and it's just a really useless talent that I have. <laughs> It, I'm, I, uh, yeah, I'm pretty good at hula hooping and the motion seems kind of similar. Um, and oh, okay. so it's like totally useless, but occasionally I can impress people with it. So I get like why, yeah, it, it's probably fun to get people's reaction to that. The, the equivalent thing is, I don't know if you remember in the movie Aladdin, he would do this thing with an apple where he like rolls it on his arm yes. and goes be behind his neck. And then I, I try to do that and teach myself. I could not do it. So it seems like you did the next best thing. Yeah, see, that's something that I can't I can't do with a basketball. And now that you mention it, yeah, that's something I have seen people do with basketballs. Or like, I remember like spiking the basketball and then like putting my arms out like this to make it land on the back of my oh, neck. Oh no, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know yeah, if I could still do it. that. Um, bowling league is that like a team sport, or is that just like you're you're playing with other people, but your score is like individualized? Gosh, I mean, I haven't been in a league since I was in high school. So, um, but yeah, it is a team effort, you know, where you're on a team with usually three other people. It's usually four to a team. And yeah, um, I wasn't great by any means, but you know, an mm. average of 140. And I think that that's fine. Yeah. I actually recently started bowling, like going bowling again, just because it's, you know, everything's shut down, but the bowling alleys are open now. So I've oh, been cool. doing that a little bit more. And actually O'Malley's who I keep referencing. Uh, it's actually the bar that's attached to West side lanes. Oh, nice. So, nice. Yeah, so a lot of times, you know, I'll put on the flyer, like, show at West Side Lanes because nobody knows where O'Malley's is. Oh, I see. Do you have your own bowling shoes, or do you rent every time? I do have my own bowling shoes. I figure yeah. if you have a ball, you must have the shoes, too. Yeah, I've got, I've got this bowling ball, I've got a spare ball, and then I've got bowling shoes. Yeah, I, I maybe bowl, like, every year and a half. Like, what, what is it about there's just no traction on the bottom of the shoes, or there's more? Like, what, what makes them special? They're, they're flat. So yeah, they, they, yeah, I guess it's not that they don't have traction. It's that they have a specific type type of traction. So when you okay. get up to the foul line, you stop in just the right amount of time. Oh, I see. Okay. It, it's all based on preference. You know, some people prefer to slide their feet a little bit more. Others just want the full stop. And it, yeah, it's all about technique at the end of the day. Everybody has their own technique as far as throwing a bowling ball. Cause everybody's body's different, you know, shorter people, have to stand closer than taller people standing back. Gotcha. Um, I don't know how many more bowling questions I have, but do you have any bowling hot takes? Like if you see 
an older person and then laying next to you who's using bumpers or you're just like rolling your eyes like this dude right here? <laughs> or did you have things like that where you're judging people? Like totally just like just petty things that no one would care about, but you, you think it. I think it's more like when people do the granny shot, I'm just like amateurs. <laughs> yeah. They're not taking the game seriously. This this is a serious game, you know? It's like right. it's like being on a I guess it's like being on a golf course, like being a professional golfer and seeing somebody use the the golf stick as like a pool cue and just being like amateur. Oh, like right. you're not taking the game seriously. So I guess that's like my only thing cuz I don't know. I I am competitive to a to an extent, but at the end of the day, it's just a game. It's, it's a dumb game. <laughs> what about when people put um put like joke names on, on the computer screen? Do you put a joke name or do you always put your real name? I would actually usually put Remax. Um, nice. I'm trying to think now. Like it was more so I would try to make nicknames for my friends when they weren't there. Okay. And it would be it would be like really vulgar stuff because it's it's funny. Like yeah, let's yeah. be real. It would just be like poop head or you know just little little things like that do, do they have any sensors where if you try to put the f word is it gonna not let you do it i you imagine know, they I have something in place i don't know i would i haven't run into that yet to be quite honest yeah so i will test that out next time i go bowling i, I will test out and to see if i can put my name as like fuck head or right. fuck boy or if, if, the Poke- if the pokemon games stop you from doing it i hopefully the bowling alleys are caught up do the pokemon games stop you I'm pretty sure, or I, I don't know, or maybe probably not oh, the okay. original, like red, red and blue or maybe gold, silver. You can probably get away with it, but you might not okay. be able to. Enla- I have no idea. Gotcha. Yeah. See, I, 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 I played up until si- gold and silver. Yeah. I, I may have outed myself as someone who only played the first two generations and, and then Pokemon go. Cause I was all over that too. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Actually, since we're on that subject, I don't know if you can see that. Get, get, bring it a little closer to the camera. Cause it, Oh, Psyduck. Hell yeah. All you right, got it. so <laughs> this is... I, I, have, I have more questions then. Why Psyduck of the original 151? <laughs> um, I've always identified with uh, Psyduck. You know, like, growing up, I feel like anybody can really say this, but, like, I didn't feel like I belonged or I felt like an outcast or whatever. And I always felt like I identified with Psyduck because, you know, if you ever watch the cartoon, you know, Missy time. had a Psyduck. Yeah, and Missy had a Psyduck, and she was always just like, oh, stupid Psyduck, you're an idiot, and, you know, you're dumb, and I didn't like that. I didn't appreciate that, so I always felt like, oh, it's just, he's, I feel like he's confused. Like, I feel like nobody's really stupid. He literally stupid. is they confused, just, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's literally he confused. He just confusion. Yeah, exactly. Is, is Psyduck, Psyduck evolves into Golduck, right? Golduck seems like, that seems like an evolution that doesn't make sense. They're completely different to me. I mean, does Magikarp make sense? Does anything in the Pokemon universe make sense? The, like, uh, from Charmander to uh, like the uh, to Charmeleon to Charizard, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, that P- does, I guess. Pichu, Pikachu, Raichu, that follows Geodude to Graveler? To Graveler to Gollum. Okay, that's right, that's right. So, like, a, a lot of those make sense, but yeah, Psyduck to Golduck, the, he goes from yellow to blue. I don't like that a whole lot. <laughs> and also one thing that bugged me is I didn't even realize it until after I got the uh, tattoo. You know that Psyduck and Golduck aren't psychic type? They're, they're water are, types. I, okay, yeah. I, they, they, there are cross... Yeah. That, I, I, I probably wouldn't have guessed that, but I know in some you can have like dual types. But are, are yeah, they but just exclusively water? They're exclusively water. They are not yeah. water psychic, which always bugged me, but yeah, yeah whatever. That makes sense. Cause there, there aren't enough psych- oh, uh, there aren't enough psychic Pokemon, so I feel like give, give them. Yeah, let them just be psychic. There's so many water Pokemon. For Maybe, sure. You're, you're gonna ask if I have a favorite. Yeah, what's your favorite Pokemon? Do you have one? Not off the top of my head. Um, Gengar is really cool. For uh, sure, he's up there. Um, it, it, it's it's the hack like, just but uh. Mew and Mewtwo are badass. I like them. Definitely. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm treating this as a serious question because it has there, there there are consequences to this decision here. Oh, definitely. Yeah, there's and it's it's not out of the ordinary to be like, well, damn, I I have like ten to choose from. Like, really, like right. So many good ones. There are a lot of good ones. Oh man. Cause yeah, you can just go based off cool factor who who I identify with. You identify with Psyduck. Oh, that 
I, I'm, I, I don't want to waste podcast time, but I'm going to think about this. And when we like turn, turn off recording, I'm actually going to give you like a solid answer after I can spend 20 minutes okay, so thinking about this. I, I do want to interview, uh, you know, you and uh, your bandmates of high crime. So oh, yeah, yeah. when we come back, to. when we come back to this on my podcast, I will ask you this again. Make a note of it. Cool. Yeah, I got uh, you. Well, I, I want to give you the last word here. Um, are there any other things you want to let, let people know about with Cap City? Or uh, I, I know you have some shirts for sale. You're wearing one right now. But any other shout oh, yeah. outs or uh, information we didn't touch on you want to put out there? Uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, I guess at this time, I just want to say uh, support your local venue, even if they aren't open for shows, because without those places to house live music shows, you know, then we don't have anywhere. So I recommend you uh, go to O'Malley's, go to LaVoyer, go to the Pig Bar. Uh, I'm sorry if I forgot y'all. Um, and also, uh, don't be afraid to go on to Bandcamp and, you know, throw your friends five bucks for their music. Like, I know it's free on Spotify, but like everybody is hurting and just imagine having to be told that your hobby is, you know, potentially putting people at risk. Like I can't throw a show because what if 50 people gather and 50 people get sick? Just, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, at the end of the day, just to whoever's listening or watching out there, just, uh, be kind to each other and support local as much as possible. Cool. I, I'll piggyback off that because they're, yeah, we, we like, like our band, we lost so much money when, uh, when shows are canceled, we're operating at a deficit. We've still been mixing songs and like creating videos and we're not making money off that. So if people can donate on band, band camp Fridays in particular, artists get a hundred percent of their income. But mm -hmm. a, a lot of you out there, you also, you've lost jobs too. You may be on unemployment and you can't afford to. So like, don't don't hurt yourself to support us. There are a lot of free ways to support bands too. If you can't give money, even things like following bands on Spotify or just telling your friends, I think this band is cool. You should know about them. Like subscribing to all their social media things that helps them with algorithms. They're, they're definitely if if you can help with money, that's amazing. But there's so many free ways to help bands that uh that should not be overlooked as well. Right, and also to the bands out there, uh, you know, I'm just gonna end off with this. Uh, yeah. yeah. Just because you can't perform, it doesn't mean that you're out of options. Like, I think the biggest bummer that I've seen is there are some bands that are going to want to perform once things open up again. But in the past year, they did nothing to gain Facebook, Twitter, Instagram followers, or make any new music or even post on social media. So utilize this time is the best advice that I can give because you can't get back this time. This time is precious. We got to utilize it while we can. Great. Well, this man's full of wisdom. It was nice uh, meeting you, talking to you about music. and uh, I Yeah, likewise, some things. Mitch. Cool. All right. Well, later, everyone. All right. You have a good night, y'all. Peace.